Why are we here on this holiday, brethren? What is the reason for it? We know the answer from Genesis because what God had created was good and for created humankind, God said it was very good, like excellent. God, however, gave Adam and Eve free moral agency. We all have free moral agency as well. Obedience for them, just as it is for us, was a choice. We all have choices to make. Their original first bad choice, their sin, separated them from God and separated them from the tree of life, which represented the Holy Spirit. It would have led to eternal life for them, all of us, since their time, with the exception of Jesus Christ, have made our own bad choices that have separated us from God's great hope for all of humankind. That hope is that we can inherit immortality within his very family when we become a part of it. God the Father and Christ want to share eternity with as many others as they possibly can, those who will learn to love just as they love. That is their hope for as many as will choose life. So Christ, the second Adam, had to come and lay the groundwork for God's plan of salvation that will be offered to all of humankind, not just a few. Now it is a few of us right now, at this present time, and you know, there will be a time for all of humankind. The beginning of that plan starts with Christ being offered as our Passover lamb, which we commemorated a couple of nights ago, so that the penalty of death that we each have incurred through sin could be paid in our stead. Well, we are aware of all these things, but again, why are we here? The Passover lays the foundation for the rest of the holidays. It lays the foundation for us to build God's plan of salvation upon as it unfolds. Why are we here? Well, we are here, brethren, to regain the connection to our father that was lost to the first Adam and obviously through our own sins since that time. We are here to be reminded to build on the foundation that leads to eternal life. These days of unleavened bread are very important. Let us refresh our understanding of why are they commanded by reading God's instruction to Israel in Exodus chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13, verse 3. And Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you went out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand the Lord brought you out of this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. So these verses, brethren, tell us that the days of unleavened bread is not just a period of time when God's people are passive. We are here to remember. Emphasis is on remember what God did for each one of us. Egypt is a type of our own sinful past. When we were held prisoners in our own carnal minds. We were freed from that prison, Egypt symbolically, at the time of our conversion, and that was when Christ became our Passover lamb for us symbolically. Now during these days, we remember how God had called, how he had called us and what was done for us powerfully, because God miraculously opened our minds so that we could even begin to comprehend that. What we thought was, you know, personal freedom in our previous life was really personal bondage. It took a miracle for that to happen. God led us to godly repentance so that we could literally escape the bondage of our past. Therefore, during these days, we humbly contemplate the miracle God performed in our lives by freeing us from our sinful past. And in the process of this remembering, we also do not eat leavened bread. Verse 4. On this day you are going out in the month of Abib, and it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Hiveites and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you a land flowing with milk and honey, that you shall keep this service in this month. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. And on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days. And no leavened bread shall be seen among you, nor shall leaven be seen among you in all your quarters. So you see, we consciously, very purposefully, eat unleavened bread because we understand a tremendous symbolism here. That is why we put leavening out of our lives 
and out of our homes during these days. Now all of this is combined with remembering, which actually inspires us. When we remember, it inspires us to put out the leaven and to consume the unleavened bread. The leavening that we put out is symbolic of sin. In Ezekiel chapter 28, we read that sin was found in Lucifer when his heart became lifted up, when he became proud, corrupting his once perfect wisdom. Once he became puffed up, he became God's adversary. Leaven is a physical agent that puffs bread up, just as pride puffed up Lucifer's mind. The symbolism is very clear. Just a little bit of leaven can permeate an entire bowl of bread dough. Likewise, just a little sin can spread through an entire group of people, depending on the choices we all make. Now, sin is the thing that separates us from God and that can imprison us in our own minds. It takes away the freedom we can have through Jesus Christ. That is why it is so fitting on these days that God commands us to remember his miraculous intervention in our lives, that we also exert great energy in putting sin out of our lives. To put sin out, it honors God. It is an, enclo- it is an acknowledgement that God's way leads to life, light, truth and goodness. It sets a proper example of his name and his way of life to the world, which is incredibly important. It also improves our lives personally in terms of freedom from fear, which is a great blessing. But it is also, you know, priceless for our children being able to see us overcome, for they usually mimic what we do. Verse 8, And you shall tell your son in that day, saying, This is done because of what the Lord did for me when I came up from Egypt. It shall be as a sign to you on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the Lord's law may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this ordinance in its season from year to year. Now the reason we actively eat unleavened bread and actively put the leavening out of seven days, brethren, is because of God's intervention in bringing us out of Egypt. So that the younger generations can see us actively putting sin out of our lives because we are so grateful, because we have remembered and we value what we remember. Obviously, in this process, we explain all we can about what God is really like because there is a huge misrepresentation of God in this world. Psalm 78, written by Asaph, has something to tell us. Psalm 78 Verse 1, give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I'll open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. Well, brethren, the dark sayings are the deep things of God, hidden things that the world cannot comprehend because they don't yet have the spiritual connection to God. They will have an opportunity in the future to have that through Jesus Christ. Verse 3, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord, and His strength and His wonderful works that He has done. For He established a testimony in Jacob, and appointed a law in Israel, which He commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children." that the generations to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their to their children. So you see, this is a generational thing, you know. This is what God intends. Verse 7, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. Well, parents were to bring up, you know, God's praises to their children so that they could begin to understand God's strength, his goodness and his intervention on their behalf. So that, you know, that they wouldn't set their hope in just the physical things they could see because this is so easy to do. We see something, you know, and we plot our own course and we decide how we are going to do it. But instead of that, we teach our children to see spiritual solutions. We teach them to see what God would have us to do. So instead of seeking physical solutions to life's challenges, they would learn, our children would learn to seek spiritual solutions to all the challenges because they learn to put their confidence in God. That is why, and that is what this is all about. 
That is why we remember and why we teach our children. They were to learn from their parents through their continual example. That is why it is so important for us to do these things that God has commanded us to do. From Mark chapter 4 verse 34, we know that Christ would explain the details of his parables. Now he would explain them when he was alone with the disciples. Now likewise, God expects us to explain the deeper things of God to our children so they can learn that to trust God above themselves. Because we live in a society that trusts self implicitly and what God says and what God thinks is essentially thrown out the window. Verse 8. And may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart aright and whose spirit was not faithful to God. Well, you see, their fathers sought their own solutions, brethren. If we don't have food to eat in the wilderness, what do we do? Complain. Well, that is our solution. How about to trust God? So they th- you know, they sought their own solution in their e- arrogance. And they set a wrong example in that way. Verse 9, the children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. Well, you know, Ephraim was very skillful with bows and arrows, but, you know, they trusted also in their armor. Well, that is the problem, you see, because they trusted in their armor instead of God. And like today, Ephraim has missile defense systems. They sought a physical solution. Verse 10, they did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in his law and forgot his works and his wonders that he has shown them. Marvelous things he did in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt, in the field of Zoan. He divided the sea and caused them to pass through and he made the waters stand up like a heap. In the daytime also he led them with the cloud and all the night with a light of fire. He split the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink in abundance like the depths. He also brought streams out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. Well, better in all these miraculous things, they forgot. These are amazing things God did, and yet they lost sight of God. Verse 17. But they sinned even more against him by rebelling against the Most High in the wilderness. And they tested God in their heart by asking for the food of their fancy. Yes, they spoke against God. They said, can God prove, can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Well, you see, they were seeking their own spiritual solutions their way. They lost sight of God. Verse 20, behold, he struck the rock. So that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide meat for his people? Well, see, this was the attitude of Israel in the wilderness. You know, they had no confidence in God for the solutions they needed. Verse 21. Therefore the Lord heard this and was furious. So a fire was kindled against Jacob and anger also came up against Israel. Because they did not believe in God and did not trust in his salvation. You see, Asaph has shown us that God wants and expects us in terms of teaching our children to always look to him. You know, he has shown us that the fruit of this connection is to come to the point of not believing God. So, we know well that unbelief was the reason why Israel failed in the wilderness. And that is the reason, and that is what the Apostle Paul expressed in Hebrews chapter 3. In Hebrews chapter 3 tells us, it tells us that faith comes by hearing, something that James also says in his epistle. Now, faith comes by hearing. Now, our children need to hear it from us. You know, we need to hear it from us as well. That is why God commands us to tell our children why we keep the days of unleavened bread in the manner that we do. We can reaffirm to them how God has helped us personally. God has helped each one of us in this room personally to overcome in life and to find solutions to problems. Those are the things we need to talk about to our kids so that, you know, they can comprehend it. So that they can develop their very own faith in our God who delivers us out of sin's grasp. 
Now, faith and humility are inseparable because humility doesn't puff up. It is the original the leavening agent that caused and causes us to believe that we hear what we hear it is spoken by God. When we hear it in his word, the principles, the projects, the precepts. So that is what causes us to hear it and to follow it. Well, consuming unleavened bread is equally important, brethren. But there is something that happens when we explain to anyone why we put sin out because of what God has done for us. When we present information, we all learn from those who present information. But in the person, or the person who invariably learns the most is the presenter. We have to search our minds and we don't want to mislead anyone. Also, we, you know, so we scratch, we dig and we search God's word for information. Now, teaching why we put sin out, as well as the unleavened attitude that is necessary in doing it, will drive us deeper in our own spiritual lives because we have an impact on the next generation. There was always a certain level of expectation prior to any of the holiday season, seasons of the year. You know, and being Israelites led by the Spirit, we can allow a certain undercurrent of negativity associated with abstinence from the leaven products. Uh, you know, depending on the level of spiritual maturity. Now, during the days of unleavened bread, our primary focus is on putting sin out of our lives. In his message to the seven churches in Revelation, seven times Christ affirms that it is the overcomer who will reign with Christ, not be heard by the second death, and will become pillars in the temple of God. Now there is this emphasis on God's saints needing a needing to change. So from a carnal perspective, we can get to the points saying like, "Oh, it is like I'm never good enough." But then that is the attitude of the world. How do we then, you know, teach the principles of this day if this is our attitude? Well, obviously we cannot do it properly in that state of mind. The spirit of this world, which is the spirit of Satan, has a demented, unholy view of change that won't move us toward God. But the carnal mind hates to be, hates to be wrong. The carnal mind, brethren, hates not to be right just the way it is, which is to say it hates God. It is puffed up, you see. We have plenty of evidence in the world we live in where, you know, evil is called good and good is called evil, every month in the news we find something new that we just can't believe is actually happening. We see how quickly things are unwinding in the United States. And, you know, if we are to teach, brethren, we have got to see something entirely different than what's normal in this world. Proverbs 29, verse 18. Proverbs 29, verse 18. Where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint. But happy is he who keeps the law. Well, other translations say, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. You see, brethren, the vision or the revelation is something that God has revealed to us personally or as a group, whatever the case may be. You know, it may be something ahead of us in the future, it might be even God's will for us right now, in the here and now, with some decision we have to make. Well, in any case, this vision or spiritual insight, as we see here, is tied to the keeping of God's law, in which there is, you know, keeping in which there is no uh, dullness and drudgery and negativity. The Bible doesn't say there is dullness and drudgery, drudgery and negativity in, in, you know, in God's law or in God's way. It says that with spiritual insight, there is, you see, happiness. Now, without that vision, the people do what our culture is doing today. They perish. The word perish is translated from the Hebrew word para. And the word para means, basically, to loosen. Uh, means to go back to and means to basically return to where we used to be. So, 
you see, it is going backward, not forward. To lose and to go back, to be made bare. In essence, when we lose our spiritual drive, it is loosened without vision. We are made bare, that is, we lose the armor of God, we lose our defensive mechanisms, and we go back to Egypt. We go right back where we started from. Now, if we are going to teach anyone what God has done for us by how we live our lives, we have to be able to see clearly what God sees. Our adversary makes the world around us see God's way of life as drudgery and slavery, when in fact it brings the ultimate happiness and freedom. The exact opposite, you see. Now, Hosea chapter 4, we have a similar saying in Hosea chapter 4 to that proverb. And uh, we have one additional detail right there in Hosea chapter 4. Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because... You have rejected knowledge. I also will reject you from being priest to me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. Well, better in mind the detail. I also will forget your children. These people that Hosea is referring to are destroyed for a lack of the knowledge of God. In other words, they have rejected the knowledge that would have been a means of personal improvement to them. It would have made their lives so much easier, so much better. But knowledge that would make them genuinely happy, that's what it was. But how you know, did they reject that knowledge and the vision it gives? Well, that vision gives us drive to go forward. How did they reject it? Well, to reject that, the vision is to spurn it. This is the biblical definition. To spurn it, to abhor it, to cast it away, to loathe it, to reject it. But you see, rejecting is always preceded by something else, and that is by forgetting. You know, forgetting happens when we don't think about it to be to the point that we become oblivious to what it is God has done for us. We forget who we are. We forget who God is. Just like the physical Israel that God rescued from Egypt eventually forgot who they are, and who their God is. Now, God brought each one of us, brethren, He brought us out of our personal Egypt. He replaced our bondage with total freedom, such as we could never have ever earned, because it is priceless through the blood and body of Jesus Christ. You see, our Father committed Christ to lead and guide us through life, directly, you know, and also indirectly through the ministry, why? Well, until we all come to the unity of faith and the, the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure of stature of the fullness of Christ, as Paul wrote and put it in Ephesians chapter 4. Now, to come to that glorious state involves indeed glorious change. It is not a burden, it is a delight. It makes us happy. To become like God in the, you know, is the vision of visions. But Satan wants to turn the personal glorious overcoming that we are immeasurably privileged to do through life. He wants to turn it into a drudgery, into discontent. He wants us to forget and then reject knowledge from God, the vision that he was set, uh, and uh, the vision that he has of our freedom, which we have already entered into through baptism, and then entry, we will enter, enter it also into his family at the resurrection. If Satan could cause us to become oblivious to what has been done for us and to what lies ahead, then we won't be able, indeed, to tell our children or anybody else why we do things we do, because we won't be doing them, you know. And Adam uh, was the one who started all of this. And then, you know, if we just neglect such a great knowledge, as we read in here in Hosea, God will forget our children, because we wouldn't pass the knowledge of God to them as the next generation. Now, as we think about this, 
look what God has to go to try to get the attention of those who have become complacent and who have lost their fire and their appreciation of for personal change of becoming like Christ. Now, how could that ever be, brethren? How could that ever be a drudgery to become like God, to become a being that encompasses love? In essence here, what God is asking is, what is more important to you, to go back into bondage or your children's future? Let's look, let's look at Hebrews 11, the faith chapter. We have something to read about Moses who led Israel out of Egypt. To read right there in Hebrews 11.24. It says that by faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Well, you see, it says by faith because Moses did believe God. Moses had an unleavened attitude. He chose not to fit in with the culture of his day. And it is the same thing that every one of us has done at baptism. We made that same choice. We understand that we won't fit in with our former friends necessarily. Perhaps with some we will. We anticipate that we might be thought of as weird or strange well, we will be locked down on by the world, just as Israel was, uh, was basically uh, ostracized and was looked down upon by Egypt. So we decided to be looked down on by the, wor- by the world. But again, brethren, our choice, just like the one that Moses made, does not exclude us from the pleasures God intended for all humankind. It does not exclude us from those pleasures, just from the pleasures of momentary sin. Verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as uh, seeing him who is invisible. Now, emphasis on, is on he, seeing him who is invisible. Well, because of this relationship with God, and because of his relationship with God, he valued you know, more greatly being thought of a le- as less, more greatly than any wealth that he could have attained by staying in Egypt, by staying in sin, staying in captivity. So Moses left sin behind because he had a vision. We just read it, uh, you know, just read it right in this verse. He's seeing him who is invisible. So what is the emphasis here? Invisible, you see. It was Moses. He was looking, his vision was on him who is invisible. And he wanted to be thought of a less, more greatly than any wealth that he could have attained by staying in Egypt. So he left that sin behind because he had a vision. He had a vision that most men cannot yet see. And it is not their fault, of course, because most men have not yet been called by God, but he didn't leave all pleasure behind. Just those that were leavened, you see. That is what we need to understand. You know, Christ-like life is not something that is without pleasure. There is much pleasure there. But we just leave those leavened pleasures, those sinful pleasures, brethren, those momentary pleasures that are sinful and against God. Now, what about Satan, of course? Well, Satan certainly wants us to think... There is nothing wonderful and exciting about this way of life. Well, that is not what God intended at all. You see, Moses gave up the bad life for the good life. Satan worked so hard at making good look evil and evil look good. You see, but the humble mind, the unleavened mind, sees what is invisible as yet invisible to the masses. One day it will involve all humankind. But the humble mind sees the immeasurable blessing of change. You see, the humble mind sees putting sin out for what it really is. They were able to comprehend it. Chapter 11 
is a history of God's people who, by faith, overcame throughout their lives and never lost sight of what God was working out in their lives. They never lost that vision. They would have told the younger ones among them why they did what they did. And then we read in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. You see, brethren, by faith, we are in the company of those of whom the world was not worthy, as, as the Apostle Paul says in verse 38 of chapter 11 in the book of Hebrews. Now, the world wasn't worthy of those who were faithful, those who had this vision and maintained it. Miraculous change is indeed the supreme blessing we have. Hebrews 12, verse 2, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that we that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Well, we are to see Christ, the measure and stature of the person whom we will fully become. That is, brethren, our vision. You know, Christ began the work in us that we now anticipate more and more as we change through life. He is the one who began it, that good work, and he is faithful to finish it if we don't forget what he and God the Father have done for each of our, one of us personally. Now, how do we know if we are forgetting? Do we have any parameters? Oh, yes. How do we know if we are forgetting? Verse 3. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to the bloodshed, striving against sin. So we are to think in these days and beyond about this, our Savior Jesus Christ, and what he went through on our behalf, we are not redeemed, brethren, with the blood of bulls and goats or with worthless things like silver and gold. We were redeemed through the blood of an individual who resisted sin at every turn throughout his physical life. You see, he lived his life from his youth up knowing the sacrifice he would have to make on our behalf. But you know, he didn't for example, knowing all of that, he didn't shoot his mouth off in response to those who did that to him. He didn't lust after women, knowing that, you know, they were each beautiful in their own way. He didn't hold grudges, but always hoped for the best. He wouldn't bear with others. He would work with others. And he was always eager to forgive. Christ was patient. Christ wasn't proud. Christ wasn't puffed up. He endured all the things he did in his final hours because he wasn't about to let his love fail for us. And it is very important for us to think often and to think soberly about who Christ was and uh, who Christ is. And also it's for us to think soberly and thankfully, you know, to the ultimate length that he went to on our behalf to get us started onto this foundation. And you see, all of this was done to bring us out of Egypt and into our Father's presence. Verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastising, chast chastening that is of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. Well, you see, Paul rightly feared that some had forgotten the great things that God had done for them in their lives. Now, why would he think that? Well, because, you know, they didn't like to be corrected and they didn't want to have to change. He saw some people who despised the chastisements, the instruction, the correction that God gave directly or indirectly through the ministry or even through his Holy Spirit. You see, God can correct us right through his spirit and put the thought in our mind and yet we still have the choice to accept or reject 
We can reject knowledge, just as we read in Hosea. You know, correction is knowledge that God gives a, a, as a blessing to enhance our lives. It is an expression of God's great love for us. I mean, what would be your reaction if your child told you a lie? Well, you would, I guess, correct it because you care for your child. You wouldn't want your children, you know, to have the curses that this type of character would bring on them in their lives if they didn't overcome. They would, those lies would ruin relationships and they would have, those children would have a ruined reputation. They would no, not be able to become stable and productive individuals who give in love, allowing that is unthinkable. Well, that is exactly how God, our God is. Instead, we would correct them, we would correct the children and we would teach them to hate lying. We would tell them why and we would tell them to love the truth. Now, doing this would lead them to God. Well, love is the same reason that Christ came in the first place. Christ says in John chapter 6 that he is the bread of life, of course. And a few other things he tells us to John chapter 6. In John 6 verse 38, he says, For I have come down from heaven, the words of Jesus Christ, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Well, you see, God the Father has a fervent desire to form his family. Verse 39. Uh, this is the will of the Father who sent me, Christ continues, that all, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who seeks the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. You see, we have been called at this time, at this point in time. You know, they, the Father and the Christ, they don't want to lose anyone who has been called. You know, Christ goes on to explain the process by which this is accomplished, and he identifies himself as the bread of life, which had come down from heaven. Verse 53. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I'll raise him up at the last day. 4 verse 55. My flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Well, brethren, he's obviously referring to the Passover symbols that we partook of, the unleavened bread being his body and the wine being symbolic of his blood. Verse 57. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Well, you see, our physical lives, right? our physical health reflect the quality of the food that we have eaten, you know. If we consume Jesus Christ, our internal spiritual health will come to reflect Him, come to be like Him. As we consume the knowledge of God over time, little by little, our spiritual health will change. It, it improves. Improves, it gets better and better. So as we continually take on more of the unleavened mind of Christ, we are automatically changing. We are, you know, we are putting the leaven out. It is a miraculous process that we rehearse during the spring holidays every single year. Eating unleavened bread and putting out leavening always go hand in hand. You see, the vision of coming to the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ has within it this natural, healthy process of change, whereby we put the leaven out of our lives. You see, this is the process that our Father set in motion by sending His Son down here as our Redeemer. However, again, our adversary hates the plan of God. Our adversary hates the plan that God has, you know, set in motion. 
Satan wants us to despise the change that takes place as we consume Christ. He wants us to despise it and to reject it. He wants us to get our eyes off the splendid vision of becoming like Christ and like our Father. Well, to embody love where there is no corruption, only goodness and kindness. Now, what David wrote in Psalm 19 paints a very different picture than what we hear in the world or what Satan would like to pump at us through the air. Psalm 19. And here is verse 7. He says, The law of the eternal is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making uh, wise the simple. Well, you see, God's law and His knowledge is perfect. It converts us. It turns us back to God. It changes us internally to begin to reflect Him. It also, you know, it is very awesome what happens in this process. Because God's testimonies are, you know, there and they also produce change. Wisdom comes in, but something exits, you know. What does it exit? Well, what exits is foolishness. Foolishness goes out to the other side, so to speak. Verse 8. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord are pure, enlightening the eyes. You see, the statutes are the mandates of God, which also relate to God's knowledge or commandments. And the change that takes place in us, as we learn to apply these statutes, brightens us up. It cheers us up. You know, change toward God makes us happy, doesn't it? You know, that is the thing that is not highly advertised in the world that we live in. You know, getting what I want right now is what makes us happy. So, however, God's commandments, those things he tells us to do are pure. And there is no downside in our obedience to, 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 to God's commandments. And there is there are no regrets whatsoever. You know, they show us how to walk through life as redeemed children of God. The commandments show us what to change as they give us wisdom. Verse 9, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. You see, the deep reverence for God has nothing bad associated with it, You know, that fear causes us to be open to change continually as we grow, so that we can, so that we can remain open to a better life. Now, it is not a drudgery, but a better life based on God's judgment and not our own. This is what uh, an unconverted attitude looks like in real life. Verse 10 and verse 11. More to be desired are they than gold, yeah, that much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Well, you see, whether it is the judgments, commandments, statutes, or testimonies of God, they all feed and change the inner person so that we are continually leaving behind the leaven for something better. Now, you know what? No amount of money can buy the miracles and the miraculous life that we can live as we consume Christ and as we change into His nature. Verse 12, speaking of Jesus Christ, who can understand His errors, Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Well, brethren, David didn't see change or correction as gloom and doom and bondage. It was priceless to him because it meant freedom from having sin 
you know, that can have dominion over him. And it was the ultimate freedom. For us, it means becoming more and more like Christ as we consume his unleavened bread. It also means getting a living example for the younger ones among us by faithfully seeking spiritual solutions to all of our problems, whether they are physical or whether they are, you know, spiritual. In other words, believing God, trusting that what he says is true, when they see that it, in, in us, that in us, and that kind of attitude in us, brethren, that gives them an example to follow. Because we do what Christ would have, you know, have us do in our circumstances. Uh, you know, we, when he was walking as a flesh. So today he is no longer a flesh. He is now in his glorified body. So we do what he would have done in our circumstances were he walking in the flesh among us today. So, you know, we talk about the miracle of change that takes place in our minds through God's mighty power. Well, that is why, brethren, we are here. We are here to powerfully and happily reset our vision for the year ahead.